Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the League of Legends Collegiate Championship presented by State Farm. And we are back with the round of 16 featuring the best teams that Collegiate has to offer. Joining me today once again is going to be Dylan Kleinven, who will be shepherding us through all of the teams, the programs, all the games, and of course our guest as well. Very happy to introduce Alyssa Horif Chen to everyone, the Collegiate Event Lead at the University of Waterloo. Or if how are you doing today? Um, I'm doing good. I hope you guys are doing good as well. Um, really excited to be here today. So appreciate you guys just help us be in here. Of course. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I love the fact you're repping your school as well. Good to see all the collegiate gear and some of that fun is diving into the games for this Mother's Day weekend. We Ooh. have some more exciting matches for you as really looking forward to seeing what we have to offer. But first, before we dive into the matches for today and this weekend, we have to see exactly how we got here in the round of 32, taking a look at the bracket as we had a lot of action-packed games in the first week. And I'm curious, Dylan, we talked about it at the end of last week. We have had a week to think about it. Any matchups to you that stand out from this week or any surprises from last week on the bracket that you see? You know, not too many surprises. I think the underperformance from, not Buffalo, what was the other team that came up? North, Northeastern? Northeastern. Yeah, I yeah, think their, their underperformance was probably the only surprise from last week, at least for me. A lot of them, as you can see on this bracket, two zeros across the board. Uh, the dominant teams won in the round of 32. Now is where things get really interesting, right? Because you'll have teams that stomped last week, and now they're playing against each other. That's pretty much the case in our first game. You know, we have Purdue versus U of T in the top. And, you know, we're going to move on to the second half of the bracket now. Some other really great matchups here. I think the GVU series is actually another upset. I forgot about that one until now. Mm -hmm. But other than that, mostly what you expected to see across the board. Yeah, a lot of great games in the last week. If you missed them, shame on you. If not, you can catch them actually on the LOL Esports VODs channel. Uh, the official events and highlights. Really happy they're throwing up all the good games there. As we had all the coverage for you across three streams. I know today, going to have a lot of games coming at you once again on two streams. As we're very excited to uh, once again be featuring all the collegiate action action across two broadcasts we are starting off today's broadcast with purdue versus university of toronto on this stream you can also catch the illini going up against the university Ooh. of buffalo another invite team from the esea the conference that we competed in with miami ohio dylan as they're going to be going up against a team that has a lot of history throughout all of collegiate the last team to take out maryville in the collegiate championships was this illini roster not the same one but the same team and org a couple of years later, gonna have to see if they can keep their tournament hopes alive against Buffalo. Really hype over there on Upsurge Esports, but we gotta start focusing on this stream and on what we have in front of us today. As Horif, I know we have Purdue versus University of Toronto Esports and Winthrop versus the Highlanders. And I'm kind of curious what you think. I know that your background, a lot of it up in Toronto, we have one of those teams repping us today. Uh, what are a few of the things you can maybe tell us some insights you can give us into the team that's going to be starting off uh, today in University of Toronto Esports? Um, for sure. So Toronto has been really successful in uh, the Ontario uh, post-secondary league. Um, so they've actually won the, the league against the Western Mustangs, which we see a uh, potential matchup in the future if UFT does move on past this series. Um, and of course, if Western wins their series. So I'm excited to see where this will go if they do manage to um, uh, win against Purdue. But I do know that Purdue also does have a really strong roster. Um, so I'm really excited to see how this matchup goes. Um, I know UFT definitely put up a fight. So I'm really excited to see what they can do with their resources here. Yeah, we're just going to have to see how those games go and starting up here in about 10 minutes getting into the draft. But that gives us plenty of time to actually break down what that path to victory may be for either of the teams. And Horf, I love the insight you're giving us on Toronto Esports. I, also that Ontario post-secondary league mm -hmm. as well. I actually didn't know about that before today, but great to see all these collegiate teams getting even more chances to compete against each other and test their wills in the tournament before we dive into this big one where it's the round of 16. As you mentioned, Purdue's a tough team. The teams are only getting better as we continue to move through this tournament. And that's in the round of 16. Dylan, I kind of want to start off with Toronto and with you. Sure. 
What do you think could be their path to victory today going up against one of the best teams from the North? You know, we talked about it in our prep before the series, but I think the key to this matchup is going to be both the top laners and the junglers. I think 527 had one of the best performances of any top laner last week, right up there with actually Purdue's top laner, who also had a very dominant performance. So I think Toronto really needs to unlock their top jungle duo to have success. You know, Donkey was pivotal in their wins last week. He's been pivotal throughout the season for, you know, U of T's success as a team. And in order to actually maintain that high level of gameplay, they need to make sure that they keep that up. And also another thing to note about U of T is that Last week, they were one of the only teams that actually seriously pulled off a lane swap. And that's something that was brought up during the interview in the background with this team. They are not very set in stone in terms of who plays what. You know, it's not like a Maryville where you're going to see Auto Orange in the jungle every single time. You're going to see Wolfie in the mid lane every single time. This team is pretty flexible, right? If somebody sees a, a pick or a champion that they're good at, for example, Swain is something that we saw in last week's games. They have a very, very prolific Swain player, uh, Defref, I believe. And if Swain is a good pick, he's going to pick it and he's going to just swap to wherever the Swain is good, you know, wherever he feels like the matchup is strong for him. And that's something that I think gives U of T an advantage over other teams. They're not as rigid as some of these other programs are. They're very flexible in how they play. They're very kind of chaotic, in your face, up tempo. And that's exactly what you need to pull off a what we think is an upset against Purdue. I know that, as you mentioned, Horth, Purdue being a very dominant team, but hey, Toronto third in the East with all the stiff competition that we've had across all of the regions. Pretty good from them, but I know diving into this week, I think one of the big storylines that we had in week one and that round of 32 was the fact that none of the invited teams lost and no teams from the North dropped yeah. a game. And Horth, you know, kind of coming from your perspective on Waterloo, a team that does compete in the East, What's it like for uh, these East teams kind of going up against a team from the North? It's been a rivalry that's been brooding for quite a few years. W what are your hopes for Toronto going into this? Um, I think I, I really love to see Toronto um, move forward in the tournament. Um, so that they just have to play these games very well and play, play with those fights very well. Um, I would love to see Toronto continue on. And, um, you know, they, they are not a varsity supported team um, but neither is purdue mm -hmm. but um i love to see you know a canadian team move forward as most canadian teams are not varsity support whereas in america you'll see a lot more uh supported teams so i'd love to see a little bit more canadian representation up there uh, especially in the later stages of the tournament mm -hmm. so that's always great to see um yeah <laughs> Yeah, and speaking a little bit on how dominant the North is, this is actually Purdue's first time qualifying for the top 32. They've always been stuck behind kind of that wall of the Northern Conference, the Maryvilles, the other schools that have dominated, but they actually made it through this time. They got in the top three. They didn't even have to be invited. Like uh, Bethany, I believe, was the invited team from the Northern mm -hmm. Conference. But that's pretty amazing for Purdue. And it's very exciting that these players are able to play on this national stage for arguably the strongest conference in the country. And being able to represent the North is is a big feat for this program, especially considering that they are not a varsity program, as Horif alluded to. You know, they are completely club run. They have been supported by their club since 2015. And that is pretty amazing because just having players that are able to play at such a high level, sparking some of the, the varsity support that other teams have in terms of you know fully fleshed out coaching staffs, in terms of you know scholarships that the players can rely on a little bit less or worry a little bit less about like academic performance and things like that all of these things are you know playing against purdue yet despite all of that they've made it here and they've been so dominant as well yeah and dylan i know that before we kind of got uh, this pregame going you were talking a lot about what it's like for purdue having a coach like dreher behind them as well yeah dreher is one of the top collegiate coaches he's right up there with the likes of zoo with the likes of you know special from harrisburg he is somebody that's been in the space for a while and he's somebody that you know i've always had my eye on as one of the best coaches both in terms of just game plan in terms of preparation in terms of draft and i think that's going to be one of the difference makers in this series because toronto actually does not have you know, a listed coach for their program. I am not mm -hmm. entirely sure how their drafts are run, if it's completely player done, if there's some outside force that they just don't list as their coach. But having 
Dreher on your team, that's always going to be a plus because it's going to make sure that Purdue in this meta that values flexibility, creativity, you know, proactiveness, Purdue is always going to be at the forefront of that. They are always going to be happy to pick champions like Pike support for Flawed Logic, like these new AP junglers for Clam. You know, they've got some wonky picks in the mid lane as well for Holy Carp. You know, he's got the, um, the Talia mid. He's got all sorts of things that aren't very commonly played right now that UFT is going to have to find some answers to for sure. Yeah, and I know that uh, Purdue as a whole, you mentioned how strong the North is as a conference. Once again, uh, the, fi the five teams representing the North, they all got through, right? It, it was Maryville, Columbia, uh, the Illini, Bethany. Everyone was able to move on, right? And, and that that's a really big deal when looking at uh, not only that, but also the invited teams. And I know from sitting down over the week, we got the chance to talk with a lot of the team's players and coaches. In this case, I actually got the chance to sit, sit down with Dreher. And I know that, Horace, something that popped out to you was uh, how high Dreher is specifically on some of his players, specifically his jungler. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Dreher really loves to gas up Clam, you know? He really yeah. believes that Clam is one of the best <laughs> junglers in the tournament. And um, I think... You know, maybe Dylan has an opinion on this because you know you're you, you yourself are a higher tier jungler, so maybe you could provide some insight onto uh, your opinions on what Dreher is saying about his jungler there. Yeah, I feel like a little bit maybe you know bias from from Dreher for sure, but I do think Clam is one of the strongest ones. You know, we saw Hyper from Illinois State. Uh, you know, as long as their roster listed is accurate for their Illinois first State. series, he's that actually... That was the one North team I was missing. Yeah. There we go. That's the um, fifth. I, 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 I can count right. Yeah, I just missed one. I believe Hyper's, you know, dropping out from participating in the Collegiate Championship, and they're subbing in uh, GFP, Gluten-Free Panda, as a replacement for him, which I do think, uh, pretty much across the board, is is just not as strong of a jungler as his, as his former, you know player was but I, I do think that clam is a solid collegiate jungler i think he's probably top three you could you could argue that high certainly top five um but it's difficult to compare against or to compete against the likes of you know the odd orange from maryville very very strong player you have um cyber slash winston whoever decides to play for um you know yeah. uwo like these are That's insane crazy. players shorter ace for yeah. harrisburg rbm for michigan all of these players have moved on to this stage and i think clam has what it takes to fit well in this meta and to play well in this meta but it's definitely going to be difficult i don't think this is a huge test for him i think he definitely has this jungle matchup secured but if he continues to move on into the top eight into the top four he's going to be up against some very good junglers with more competitive experience than he has and that's where i think he'll truly be tested yeah, and uh, going off of that, obviously, Clam, a player, a talented player from a jungler out of the north that uh, Dreher is very high on. But Horif, uh, part of the events that you've been running with Waterloo, you've actually been cover casting some of their games, and you've gotten a front row seat to see what Donkey can do over uh, in the east and also in that Ontario league. What are your thoughts on Donkey, the jungler for Toronto, coming into this as well? Um, I think that Donkey is a very strong jungler he's able to kind of set the pace in his games um i'm not sure how he matches up to clam here but um i'm really excited to see the jungle matchup and to see what both of these players can bring to the table um hopefully we can see some uh you know th these like big macro plays and just see how these junglers path and just making sure that uh they're able to kind of show what they can do in their role and what they themselves can bring to the team Really excited to see them play. That's why we have to play the games. Is well, we have to find out how those things are going to go. But before we dive into the games, I want both of your thoughts on the desk. It's my chance to put you on the spot. How you think the series is going to go? Let's start with our very special guest, Hor Horif. Do you think Toronto is going to be able to pull this one out for everyone in the East, or do you think it's going to go the way of Purdue? Um, I'm gonna hope as you know. I'm Canadian. I'm from the East, yeah. so I'm hoping <laughs> that we see uh, Toronto pull out with the with the dub here. Um, but if they do win, I'm expecting it to be a two one, um, or it could also go in the way of Purdue. But I'm thinking it's going to be a two one for one of these teams. So I think it's very even. It's kind of even, but a little bit leaning more towards Purdue. But I do hope to see UFT pull out uh, with the dub in this series. I'll, I'll keep my answer short and sweet. I think Purdue is going to 2-0 here. I think it's really heavily reliant on how Ooh. jungle and top goes, but I do think Clam's got what it takes to you know pull away 
with this series, and he's going to lead Purdue to the win. Okay, well, I have the predictions from the guest analyst, but those actually aren't the only people that are going to be lending their thoughts on the desk today to predict some of the matches as, well, it's Mother's Day weekend, and we didn't ask the mothers, but we did ask a different very special guest is, what do we have here? Oh. We oh, got to vote for Purdue. Like, <laughs> all right, looks like we got to vote for <laughs> Purdue. I, I'm going to say, ignoring the Toronto treat, that's got to be a 2-0. That, that, that's got to be a 2-0. <laughs> Horif, can you confirm Nord and I to, to our Purdue aligned with Dylan? Uh, I guess so. Yeah, that's actually my dog. So she's she's thinking Purdue oh. clearly. <laughs> okay, well you got to give us some details now. Name, uh, wh what type of dog? <laughs> what, what do we have here? Uh, her name is Coco. She is a little shepu. Uh, so she's a Shih Tzu poodle mix, and you know she loves her treats, but clearly she also loves Purdue. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I see that there might be some tension in your household when you are going for Toronto. I'll have to let you two sort that out as we are going to take a break from ourselves here at the desk, but also throw it over to the casters, get us into all the action. As once again, this week, we are happy to be joined by Mazelle and Rebel Fox. We'll be leading you through the first game of the day, Purdue versus University of, of Toronto. Guys, take it away. Thank you so much, Covey, and welcome to the Caster Desk. Yet again, round of 16 happening here. Mazel and Rebel Fox, and I couldn't be more excited. I gotta say, I'm siding with the dog on this one. Purdue all the way. You gotta go with the animals. <laughs> I'm pretty sure last week we got called dogs by Cubby as well, so yeah, we I think did. we have I mean, to stick yeah, together when it comes to our thought process. Yeah, Purdue, clearly, they're coming in as very good, and we're obviously biased because we covered a lot of the Northern Conference, got to see them up close and personal <laughs> a number of times, but I'm excited to see what uh, you know Toronto can do. Obviously, they've got some really nice talent in the jungle position, and 527, uh, amazing dude. I got to read a bunch about him, and he's an amazing player up on that top side. We'll see what it is that they can do to get him going so that Toronto can be competitive within the series yeah and i like that dylan was putting the focus on top jungle i do feel like especially in this meta they do form integral parts to how you like to play the early game so i'm hoping for some early action some early skirmishes some early blood to yell about rebel I agree. Uh, there, there's plenty of ways that this game can play out. I think aggressing against top jungle uh, on the side of Purdue, especially because those are the really good members here, or at least who we're putting a bunch of focus on for Toronto, could be a way to play. The other thing is they've got actually a very aggressive and talented bot lane between Arch and Flawed Logic on the bottom side that could really make some noise in the earlier stages of the game. So if you're not careful on the side of Toronto, even if you're doing well on top side, your bot side still has to get some coverage. Otherwise, uh, you, you got some very aggressive players down there that could take advantage very quickly. Yeah, exactly that. And we are going to be getting into the first draft of this best of three. Purdue on the blue side, University of Toronto on the red side. We already see some top lane bands, some focus coming down, Rebel. And it's going to be that Jace taking away. Rumble is an obvious band right now with the state of the meta <laughs> and the state of the strength of Rumble, as well as GP banned away by Purdue. Yep, they're putting a, a ton of pressure right now into 527 because you know that those are the champions that you're looking at. I love the Rumble takeaway from Frost Force because he, or my apologies, not from Frost, but from Clam because Clam is a really good AP jungler, as well as the Lee Sin taken away from the solo lanes to bring that one away from the rest of the team. I am curious at all if UFT is going to put pressure on the Lucian because that's a flex pick for Purdue that works really well when AP junglers come in for Clam, who's already playing things like Nidalee and Morgana and Elise and things of that regard. And I think it could be a really solid pick to take away here just to to make sure they don't get their hands on that one otherwise go to morgana go to you know something else ap just take away additional junglers away from that purdue jungler there it is the lucian band does come through as the last band of the first phase the tf band by purdue though and then you know just because we could do it i know why <laughs> Lulu first pick why not hey there, I, I, there you go I know exactly why, and that's because Arch is a Kogma player at heart. It, it, you go looking yeah. through every single Setting ADC, he's like, cool. it, it really is the long con. We've seen it pop up a couple times at MSI, and especially on this patch, yeah. as Lulu's gotten buffs, Kogma's getting a little bit more pressure. Uh, you know, the dive meta has, has slowly kind of come down as Hecarim has been pushed out, Udyr's been pushed out a little bit. There's more space for Kogma now, and so uh, Arch is, is that, like, go-to Kogma player. Whenever it's available, he's going to love to play it. You throw that alongside Fall of Logic on this Lulu, and that's going to be an amazing bot lane there to throw in here for Produce. Lane. We do have a pretty strong start, at least in the Enchanter pool here on both sides. We do get the first pick for University of Toronto, which is going to be the Karma paired up with the Jinx. So you're already getting the bot lane duos potentially set up here for both teams. 
that you are. Um, and, and this is a relatively safe combination here from University of Toronto. You do have to be careful because, again, the, the Kog'Maw Lulu can do some pretty good damage from range, yeah. but Jinx is relatively safe in the earlier phases. So I think this is going to be a bit more lax from the University of Toronto, which is ideally what you'd go for. This would be a hard flex, too, going right to the Tristana yeah, to try to be. really hard engage in. That's exactly what's going to happen. It, it looked like what happened there was, you know, Toronto was expecting what I was expecting, where you go to the comfort pick of the Kog'Maw for Arch. Instead, they play the super hard aggression, something they've been used to all season. And now all of a sudden, this Jinx is under some real pressure because there's no direct hard CC to shut that Tristana out of the bot lane plays. Yeah, and, you know, you add the Udyr on top, still making waves somehow, some way, sticking in the meta no matter what. Doesn't matter how many times you hit him with the nerf bat ride, <laughs> he will stick around. Uh, we'll see, though, as I, I think that that's an interesting choice to go in mm -hmm. for. Obviously, you get that strong front line, that strong engage, at least. Uh, but the other side is that you're kind of leaving yourself open, right? You still do have this Morgana, which is going to be picked up for University of Toronto. And I do feel like, you know, if you get the upper hand, you can get that farming going as the Morgana. You do just snowball. Eventually, that's the case. The beginning of the game is still Udyr favored in terms yeah, of clearing and a little bit of speed. So the possibility is there for Purdue to strike very quickly in this game, which you're already seeing, again, aggressive bot lane with Tristana. You throw an Udyr on top of that. They're trying to increase the pace of the, end of the game. That's what's going to be able to take over on the bottom side and potentially into the top side as well. The UFT, of course, they do have the potential counter pick. They ban away two of the stronger laners between the Zoe and the Camille. I feel like Purdue is just going to go back and pinch off another top lane here to make sure 527. Yeah. It's a bit of a flex pick, but I feel like that's also uh, towards top lane. They'll likely blind pick a mid laner here just to get something on the board to make sure that they've got resources necessary for their team uh, and then save that top lane pick 4527 who should pull a bunch of the pressure as the attempted carry in the game. Hoping to get that counter pick over there, trying to get something going as uh, it's seeming like a very synergistic composition, very team oriented composition coming out from University of Toronto. So far as they do lock in the Galio, a little bit of flexibility there, as well as some uh, some semi-global support as well. Absolutely. And even uh, if you really wanted to, to kind of start this composition into a decent foot, you could throw the Galio into bottom lane, put Karma in mid lane if you okay. get the right matchup, just to make sure that that Galio can try to deny the all-in that comes through from the Tristana and the likes of the Lulu. They do have to blind top lane here, so Valley does typically go to some of the more blind picky uh, type, like tank top laners. Mm -hmm. That's what Scion's going to be here for. This would be really interesting as another flex is the potential of Tristana into a solo lane, since now you see uh, the Galio is out of the support role, potentially uh, so we'll see if they want to, you know, you know, kind of flex on that one. This would be a really cool pick to see the Fizz come out. <laughs> oh, man. Would be interesting to see some some spice being in game nah, number chance. one, but you could just go tried and true with there some team fight. Because, you know, you look at the rest of the composition, you need something maybe to back you up a little mm -hmm. bit more sustained damage as well on top of that Tristana. It is going to be the Azir. So you get that strong lane presence in mid lane. You also get the strong team fight presence and you know, some engage of his own with the Shurima Shuffle there. I want to see what University of Toronto's response is going to be to this. This is that counter pick. This is that availability there to them. And they do go with the Aurelia. So giving 527 some tools. This is the expectation. 527 is going to be a carry yeah. for this team. They're taking it into the Scion as fast as possible just to make sure you could put some resources. Morgana, I think, is a great pairing in that regard. But you have carries across the board. You have people with a lot of lane presence across the board here for yeah. Purdue. So they want to strike quickly and they want to strike effectively across the map. They got the push in mid lane with the likes of the Azir. They've got the aggressive bot lane. They're not going to do the Galio and the Karma flex between mid and support. So you do have that all in potential from the Tristana when you go uh, you know, level two, level three with the Lulu combination. So there is that fear as well. So it feels like, uh, you know, University of Toronto has given a bit of the early pressure away to the side of Purdue in an attempt to make sure that 527 is going to have the resources necessary because you throw a black shield onto Aurelia who's fed, there's going to be some danger lurking yeah. for his composition. <laughs> yeah, so I, I do feel like this is going to be interesting in, in how the jungle pathing plays out earlier on, right? We, we did talk a little bit about Clam needing to get involved. The early game is Udyr's playground, pretty much, and, and you're trying to get as many advantages earlier on as you can as Clam, so you can transition that into later pieces like this Tristana, like the the mid lane Azir, and trying to get some coin onto those members. <laughs> but the other side, as you said, like once that level six hits, once you're getting all that kind of team synergy together, it's gonna be really hard to find those pieces. And I, I do feel like. You have some options here if you are Clam. You can try to put some resources in the bot lane, maybe try to find something that way. Or do you try and help out this top lane, not let 527 get ahead and, and try to trounce them that way? 
I think that right now, U of T is set up specifically to put resources into top lane. So I think you bring up mm -hmm. a fantastic point where it's like, you can either put some resources into top to defense that and try to hope yeah. the rest of your map on the side of Purdue is going to be fine and be able to make their own advantages, which is possible because again, I, you know, Arch and Flawed Logic are capable of doing that. Holy Kerp is capable of doing that in his own rights. On the opposite hand, you could just lean into the other side of the map and attempt to make plays and hope that Valley is able to kind of weather the storm of the early barrage of resources between the Morgana and Gal that they end up putting towards top lane. Uh, it, it is dependent, I think. I think Valley, uh, given the round of uh, 32 you know, performances that we saw from this top laner, it's definitely a possibility to soak those resources. I think that's perfectly yeah. fine. It produces a team, they're willing to lean on every single member. All of their members are capable of carrying. We've seen that time and time again in the Northern Conference when they worked their way through, ended up getting in the top four, placing into this tournament directly. And so uh, to me, I feel like Clam should have faith in the top lane here and be able to make pressure across the map, try to get Holy Therapy and Arch into really good states, control dragons, and force U of T into uncomfortable situations where it's going to be necessity that 527 is getting ahead otherwise they're just going to completely lose control yeah I, I, that's the other point that i want to talk about a little bit more so because I, I do feel like there's gonna be a little bit of time in the early game for setting up around the objective control <laughs> that you were kind of highlighting too and, and i do feel like it favors purdue at least earlier on maybe you can get that early dragon stacking going you can try to get that pressure around the map but as we get to those team fights as we get to those moments like there, there's a lot that can go either way. And I think, I, I wonder if that's where we see University of Toronto kind of try to, to dabble a little bit in that early objective control, trying to find that vision around there, make sure they're set up and find those picks potentially. But I, I do feel like the onus is on Purdue to get those objectives early on. Yeah, not to, uh, Purdue should have the ability to take those objectives early, and not to mention, like, if you get into later stages of the game, University of Toronto has a lot harder execution on their comp because, mm -hmm. you know, Aurelia should pull a number of resources and making sure she gets in on top of a Tristana who has mobility with a Lulu and yeah. then also a Zero Wall to get through. It's not particularly simple. If you do use Black Shield effectively and you can get Galia there, maybe all of a sudden you can buy space for both Aurelia, but more importantly, Jinx to fight in the later stages, but it does feel like University of Toronto have to have some presence in the earlier stages, like you were saying, to make sure they can even walk into the river. They can even make some of these yeah. plays happen to ensure that they aren't just completely run over. They're not down three dragons in 15 minutes, and all of a sudden, you gotta start team fighting with less than two items of your jinx at that point. That's just not a place you wanna be against the side of Purdue at any point, because we've seen what they can do in that situation. Yeah, and I think the, looking at the team compositions holistically, right, I feel like there's a little bit of difference in how U of T wanna play it. Because, you know, you have the Aurelia. You're going to be dip, dive, dashing forward, right? You're going to be going crazy. Everything else is pretty much like peel tools. <laughs> like, you've got the Morgana, you've got Karma, you've got Galio. These are things that are going to be pretty good at fighting back from a fight against a team composition on Purdue's side who does want to go forward. So you do have that going for you, but I do feel like the push and pull is going to be really interesting, and in, in especially how 527 pilots this Aurelia. Yeah, the Aurelia is the perhaps like the one member of both teams that is kind of different than just your normal damage dealer in ADC, where on one side you've got like a Zier Tristana, on the other side the Galio is not going to do as much, so it's mostly going to be Jinx, and then Aurelia yeah. is the other melee carry where you're interacting in strange ways. And I love the point that you bring up, where a counter engage from the side of uh, Toronto could probably do a good amount of work. For a team that like, they, they come in and they love this game and they play it as a hobby, this is pretty a high level of execution when you think about toronto yeah. where a lot of their players they said they love playing the game that's why they're playing together here and they're in this round of 16 in a very competitive place and a composition like that isn't easy to execute so well, it's a testament to just how much they believe in their own abilities in terms of this laning phase and in terms of this team fighting to bring themselves into a position against the team as good as purdue with a pedigree like purdue and to play something with this uh, level of necessity behind it you got to appreciate that toronto comes out early with a composition like this to just start Swinging. gotta gotta start grabbing up those draft bucks as we go <laughs> through this best of three uh because you know it is do or die right like the, this is you, you've made it to the round of 16 if you drop here you're out but at least you've made it this far right but you don't want to just say that that's not where you no. want to end it that's where you want to keep going you gotta get to the round of eight you gotta get even further so for both of these teams you know this first draft is going to mean a lot for this first game especially i think there's good things on both sides rebel and i, I just want to say which composition do you give the, uh, the the Rebel Fox stamp of approval to here between the two? 
It, it's got to be Purdue, man. I, I, Purdue's composition <laughs> is so typical Purdue. When you think about, like, Arch can just hard jump into any fight he wants and use this very mm. powerful Tristana to abuse the laning phase, to abuse team fighting relatively early. And you, like you said, there's some count, there's like counter engage and kite back potential. But like, if Arch is going really quickly in this game, you get one, two kills, get first tower off yeah. the board. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter if you could throw a Karma Shield onto somebody. He's going to burst them out with that Buster Shot and all the burst damage really quickly. And then there's plenty to just kind of buy space for him as well. Even if Azir goes mostly ability haste just for more walls to shut out Aurelia, that's all that's really necessary. You could just let Arch kind of go to town with the rest of this Tristana and this team that's there supporting him, the Lulu and things of that sort, a bunch of frontline as well. It feels really heavily like the early pacing should be focused towards bot lane where they can also generate their own plays. So Clem's kind of pathing is going to be interesting, but more so I think they've set Arch up for fantastic success in game one. Yeah, I think so as well. And we'll be getting a game here very, very shortly. See this kickoff of round 16 here in this best of three between these two wonderful teams. But I I, I got to give a little praise. I know you were talking a lot <laughs> about the high, the height of execution needed here for the side of UFT. Yep. They're, they're kind of pieces kind of coming together, synergizing a little bit more. I'm ready to see some fireworks at level six. I want to see if we get anything out of the mid lane from that Galio, being able to get some presence on the side lanes, things like that, because I think that's going to be super important if they are able to kind of transition into that mid game. Now, now listen, listen, Mr. Mazel, because what? you have Def Ref in the mid lane, right? And this man has got the biggest IQ of anyone at the tournament. He comes from Age of Empires. <laughs> I come from StarCraft. He RTS RTS players are simply built different, right? If anybody could pilot this composition in Shot Call, it's got to be Def Ref in this one, right? So, like, you gotta think be. that level six, that execution, it'll be there because they got the Shot Calling behind it because they, they, they are simply just smarter than their opponents for playing RTSs all the time, or yeah. at least Def Ref has that capability. I mean, hey, all League of Legends is is an RTS on a different page. We'll see what happens right. here as we do get into game number Hello. one. Get a little bit of the wildlife before we get into the wildness <laughs> of this series. Best of three, starting now, Purdue versus the University of Toronto. And Mazel bribed our observers to make sure that we could get the shots of the animals before the game actually started. But big, big props to them. Get the animal buff. Yeah, they're, they're already smurfing right now. It's not fair. Our they observers, are. we're oh, out no. here, we do a bunch of like research and a bunch of stuff, and our observers just have to flex on us like that. It, it, you got to give a ton of props. Anybody who can give applause to them, they're already smurfing today, and we only just started. So so thank you to the production team. Thank you to Observation for that wonderful shot. Yeah, I gotta gotta appreciate the backbone that is any broadcast and mm -hmm. the uh, production team, the observers, everything that goes along those lines. I was hoping maybe we get a level one shenanigans. No. Ne neither team really the greatest level ones, but hey, we're at College League of Legends. We could have craziness anytime, but we're not going to. No. It's gonna be calm, steady, just uh, two ships in the night. Oh, are we not going to get a level one? <laughs> Although Frosty's oh. getting frosty <laughs> over here. He's got level. One damage here on the Holy Kerp, but mm -hmm. a little bit traded back as well. Holy Kerp not going to have the greatest time in mid lane now with that health deficit. Yeah, a few things to mention about this this early phase. First off, I'm going to start with a joke, which is that Little Frosty actually was like a mid laner at one point, and last week subbed into the mid lane as a Twisted Fate, so unfortunately not capable of leaving his home. Uh, he, he comes <laughs> back to the mid lane to put some abuse on the KRP. But more importantly, KRP goes for Lethal Tempo, goes for uh, the Dark Seal to start with in this laning phase against the Galio. No expectation that there's kill threat from the combination of Def Ref and Donkey, and instead is going for the very greedy setup here to try to be a DPS threat later in the game. Again, I don't think it's bad necessarily. I, I think ability haste would be perfectly fine if you rush a Zonia or something like that, be an engage bot or just a denial for Aurelia. That's perfectly acceptable. But another full damage threat will do this team some wonders, and that's the attempt from KRP or from uh, Holy Curve. My apologies. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. And I, I just want to know if we're gonna get uh, Clam, you know, getting down towards this bot lane now that we do have those opposite side starts. I'm sure. Now that we've seen a little bit of trading, uh, maybe we'll get some communication down for the ballet. Hey, hey, Clam, please help. <laughs> we, we can, we're getting pushed in. It's going to be perfect for you ah. to get first blood potentially. Although Flawed Logic getting some serious damage put down with the poke that comes out from Lil Frosty in sicko mode. Psycho yeah. mode. 
Yeah, the the initial like laning phase here from the Jinx and the Karma is difficult, I think, to read from Argent Flawed Logic, but their range advantage combined with the AoEQ from Karma gets this lane push really quickly to get level two a lot faster. Level two all in from the likes of Tristana and Lulu is really powerful because of the damage that Lulu does early. But because of the shielding and the earlier spike here from Little Frost and Seiko Mode to use their range to their advantage, they were able to pull a lot of that health off as well as the health pots out from Flawed Logic. So now no real threat of that all in, especially around the level three, and a cheater recall coming out from Zico mode and Little Frosty. I haven't seen this in a hot minute, but here <laughs> they are taking one, trying to get this quick strike up against their opposition. I was. Did Zico mode even get something to buy? Okay, yeah, Cole. Okay. Cole. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> I, I didn't see anything get bought at first. I was like, hmm. <laughs> I was worried. Little, there. I, I mean, I guess you go for the the charm for for Little Frosty. Uh, like, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you just uh, need that mana Cole, regen. You know, going for the uh, going for the longevity play <laughs> here. It will be Scuttles traded to either jungle. I wonder if we just get the resets after this one, or maybe we see this pressure move to mid. Yeah, as you're yeah. already getting pings from Donkey to mid. Yes. Holy Carapy, again, with, without Doran's Ring, without, like, Corrupting Potion or something, the mana sustain isn't there, really, and burns a lot of that to get some early pre uh, You just push into the likes of Galio just to put some abuse down. Uh, so it is just a trade. Although you did see that Donkey, he walked in, took a ward, which is a bit of an advantage. I was just waiting through that, and it doesn't look like anything comes through because 527's out of mana. But more importantly, Clam did get the back off about 10, 15 seconds faster than Donkey, so out on the map mm -hmm. faster, starts to clear faster, and he's pathing towards bot lane to put some pressure in into Arch and Flawed Logic, which is what we wanted to see. Uh, if the aggression's not there to come uh, naturally from the Tristana and the Lulu combination, Clam will be able to assist this lane if he can get on top of a Seiko mode and Little Frosty here. And I know I'm getting a little antsy here uh, in my in myself, but mm -hmm. I, I want to see Clam get that pace going, keep <laughs> going, get something going, because as, yeah. as we've all seen so many times in the last couple weeks, and especially on the MSI stage, right? Wow. Morgana gets scary. <laughs> like, she, she gets real scary. She gets real fast, especially uh, in clearing the jungle. So I, I need to see that lead develop for Clam early. Uh, We've talked about how good this player can be. Rebel, you have something you obviously want to talk about. There's a couple of things to talk about. Right now, like, the wave is bouncing back to 527. He took a cheater. He's up 10 CS, and the wave is stacking back in his direction. That's, like, flawless, like, like, like wave control. Second, you notice how the slow push has come in for Jinx and the, uh, the, the Karma on the bottom lane, and notice where Clam is. In fact, so heavily did this come through that Donkey had to cut half of his jungle path down just yeah. to come down here and hover this because they were worried that Clam was going to end up down here. Fantastic reason from U of T, now heading towards the Dragon. There are three members on both sides. Both mid laners are moving Ooh. as well. Level six is not ready for anybody quite yet, though. It's a TP so as well. Yeah, they're going to commit to this. They don't want to give over this first Dragon. We said early control okay. for Purdue can be very important, very strong for yourself. They move in. It's like U of T were never even there, Rebel. <laughs> they're going to take the first Dragon. It is. Uh, it was a nice rotation from U of T. I, I will say, I think the dragon was a bit like heavy-handed. Pulling the TP though was massive because you know if Purdue throws a TP into this play, all of a sudden you get turret plates at probably two here, as well as a ridiculous amount of farm denied from the Scion and a huge lane advantage for five two seven. And that's the trade that we're going to go for. Op, <laughs> look at that cord at the bottom. <laughs> that's fantastic from five two seven. Where he says teammates. Op. It. What, it, what has played competitive League of Legends taught you that you have applied elsewhere? Teammates, are, Teammates OP. are OP. Gotta love it. Hey, I agree, 527. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, I would be nothing without Mr. Mazelm, and he would be <laughs> nothing without me as well. We, we are yes. a team, and we do fantastic work together, and outside of that, we, we just simply do not do anything. So, Teammates are OP. <laughs> that's, the, that's the tweet. I love yes, it. That's a great uh, tweet. We're getting very interesting stuff going on here. I'm still upset and this is just me, okay? Nobody else has to agree with me. That We haven't seen any blood yet. We haven't seen no. Clea being able to get something going just yet against Donkey on this Morgana. And I, I want to control. see that change a little bit. This but the way, I was going to say, the lanes themselves are really interesting in, in and of itself because of the way that the pushing and the pull has been going. Yeah, the, the wave control has been really crazy, I think, specifically for 527, but everybody on U of T is actually doing perfectly fine within their lane stays, which is surprising because, again, Purdue, I would have expected to try to play a little bit more aggressive early on with, like, the Udyr and everything else, but U of T played very defensively. They've done well farming so far to keep up inside the lane phase. Actually, have a couple of advantages in a number of places. They're playing for a bit of a gold advantage. It seems like they're trying to spike on mid-game fights, maybe, where they're going to use, like, the, the range advantage, the Karma boost, and the Aurelia on first, second, 
an item spike around like second, third dragon or something, and they're comfortable being there. And it's obvious that the scaling is is very comfortable from Purdue. That's why you see like the lethal tempo on the Azir, and they're going for like the combination of that with the Tristana and the Lulu and the late game, which is again, there's nothing wrong with anything that's happening right now. It's not how I expected the game to pan out in the slightest. Yeah. And this slow pacing actually might be helpful and might give U of T a legitimate opportunity and window to begin striking across the map. Thank you, observers, also for the shot on the Rift Herald that's going to be spawning in only 15 seconds. And that's going to be another point of contention. The quick bat came through from oh, Seeko so Mode cool. and Little Frosty. Yeah, isn't it wonderful? Our observers I'm are distracted, Rebel. Right I'm They're distracted. They're smurfing on us, man. It's so unfair. It's too good. It's too good. I want to say while you were making that point, there was almost a gank by Clam on bot side, but... Psycho Mode had gone up there, gotten a little ward on the bottom side of the Dragon mm -hmm. Pit and had spotted out Clam. They knew he was coming, so nothing comes up. And still, no influence from the jungler for Purdue just yet. Not in the slightest. Not really from either jungler. There was that play on bottom side that the TP came in on, and all that really did was give a massive CS advantage to 527. This, however, is the first moment where you're seeing some action come through from U of T, where they're looking for this Rift Herald. They get the ward out of the pit. Only just now did the bat come through from Clam, so going to be redeploying on the map. They've already got the Karma here in everything else. Jinx is also moving up river. The wave is in a correct place. They had a ward there to spot it out, so now Jinx probably has to walk back to bot lane, but Arch is there as well. And if you look, Clam and La, you know, Flog Logic are not moving up towards Rift Herald. They're willing to give this yeah. one away. So this gold advantage from UOT, where they're playing for like this thousand, couple thousand item advantage to fight around these neutral objectives in the mid game is really heavily what they're leaning into right now. And it seems like Purdue's playing into that, expecting that they're going to be able to take this late, or maybe that their team fighting is just superior to pull this game out. I'm very interested. Predator oh, this has is huge. Pop die donkey. They are going to find out little Frosty on the transition. There's the heroic entrance comes in. Clam is still looking for it. Mega Death Rocket comes across. Donkey goes in. Is going to be able to get it? That's first blood going over to Donkey on the Morgana. There but there's go. the Shreem of Shuffle. Not going to get too much just yet. But there's the double kill for Holy Kerp. And they are going to find the third as Def Rep is going to go down eventually to one of these heal? members. The heal finally comes right. out, but that is not enough. And Flawed Logic gets another one. Yeah, going to be three kills coming to Purdue. The setup was there on the initial play to try to find Karma, and they overstepped slightly because of the Galley ultimate, but really well played in a setup here from Purdue where finally Tristan is able to move out because Jinx had moved up the river slowly. That gave push over to Arch, who was then able to move into jungle a lot faster for this fight where you're going to get that chance to see. Look where Jinx is right now, stuck under the tower, and then you see Arch is able to move. This Galley ultimate, great for stalling, and it does add up the one play. KRP's here the whole time with soldiers able to throw some damage in but of course the first one here is arch to be able to turn this fight completely around almost unexpectedly as krp continues to throw soldier damage in arch also gets a couple of resets during the course of this fight to be able to pull a few damage members off and jinx is never just able to step in so great stuff in terms of your positioning on the map being able to punish that rift herald take coming through from u of t and I love the setup all day long there for Purdue. Although Flood Logic get a little low there under tower against Lil Frosty. Not going to go down just yet. But Purdue positioned for that play. Take what they get with a little bit of a 2v3, mm -hmm. 3v3 action and turn it into a positive play for themselves. So I like the early advantage, at least uh, mm -hmm. in the fight for Purdue. But now U of T right back to it. They're going to start up this drag. Notice, if you will, it looks like after that play, there was a reset to come through from Arch, and so Arch got killed off in that bottom lane play between Seeker Mode and Little Frosty, who almost got the additional kill at the end of that play, which gives them Dragon, which is not what Purdue wants, really. Again, this gold advantage is what UFT is playing for for these mid-game fights, and now gets to stall with a Dragon and additional buffs, especially 10% cooldown reduction is huge for, like, Galio Ultimate and things. And you have to remember, there's still this Raid Boss on top lane developing with 927, who just hasn't been stalled. They're trying oh. something right now. TP's coming in, too. They are full committing here. There's the Vanguard's Edge, a little diving, but it's not going to be enough. Valley is going to get the kill. Seen that a fair number of times, just ganking up towards topside to try to shut down 527. Hadn't found a full item completed. Now has Blade of the Rune King, which is nice, but a shutdown coming over specifically for Valley. They're not putting a bunch of resources like we expected. It's just been the stall tactics. Uh, this is what happened on okay, bot side. Yeah, no bot. reset had come through, so here's Arch. I'm curious where Karma comes into this equation because she's still a ways out to begin this. They're shoving this wave likely as an attempt. Arch jumps oh. in. That's the, that's the over aggression we talk about that's from time to time. Yeah. It's so oh, close. No, Oh no! <sighs> yeah. All right, that's uh, that's that's an F in chat. Unfortunate, but <laughs> hey, 
you at least make the confidence play, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and flawed logic doesn't go down, so it's fine. Yeah, like I said, it looked like the attempt there from Arch was just to reset the wave and then got a little antsy. And they're like, okay, we have Lulu ultimate. We could try to put pressure in here if you jump in and get the knockup and we can get that kill. But unfortunately, not close enough. Doesn't get anything. CC comes the through. The buster yeah. shot was like 50 it was, health yes. off from getting Something the kill. Like that. Yeah, very, very so close. You All get right. the Rift Herald going in bot lane, though. A lot of gold given to the trio here. Not going to get the tower all the way, but at least got a couple plates. Valley is down here on the bot lane, too. So it looks like they have just given up on the top lane. Oh, TP. nope. There's the TP. Was here just in case they wanted to try and go for a dive. Yeah, these uh, the TPs from Valley haven't been the most inspired, but 527 hasn't actually used the TP yet, which I think is one tactic that has yet to be pulled out. The trap card has been laid from UFT yeah. to use that Aurelia in an aggressive fight, especially with see if KR or if Kerp or if Arch end up going really heavily into a fight and you find a counter engage with like an Aurelia on a tank or a flank or a TP, my apologies, then that is a play that UFT, UFT have not pulled out quite yet to mm -hmm. that you still have to respect really heavily. But right now, we, we talked about it before the game. It's started how they wanted to slow down top lane slow down 527 the very minimal resources that valley have received in the early game not being solo killed so far by 527 even after some of the waves have been lost has put them into a position where now all of a sudden this is a tanky enough scion where there's no real threat of yeah. killing against them uh barring just like standing still inside the wave and just tanking auto attack after auto attack by the likes of the uh the aurelia here yeah, and the CS differential has gone down just a bit, so not, bit, yeah. nothing too crazy. And, mm -hmm. and as you said, just getting tanky enough to be that rock for the team, be that frontliner, be that engage if they need to with the unstoppable uh, onslaught. So we'll see how this all works out, Purdue, as they <laughs> crest into that mid game. We're at that 14 minute mark. Clam was maybe thinking of going towards bot lane, but uh, just going to farm his Krugs here after using the Blast Cone. I was wondering if maybe because of the pushing that Psycho Mode is doing right now with Lil Frosty that they would try to transition Clam down here and finally get some uh, get some jungle influence mm -hmm. down on the bot side, but it does not look like that's going to be the case as we're getting resets pretty much across the board for U of T, but we're getting a uh, nice trading from 527 in the top lane. Trying to pull some health off right here. Notice that the back had come through from Seeker Mode and Little Frosty. I thought maybe they were going for a really kind of early lane swap here where they're going to move into top side and Aurelia was just going to TP to bot lane to hold that turret or something along those lines, but it's not going to be the case. They're just going to go back into bot, and uh, I don't know what the plans for Rift Hero are here. You guys still have a minute on Dragon as well. Both junglers ended up on bot side, but there goes Clam, unfortunately. So uh, And backs to come through now because the wave had been shoved by the bot lane, so nothing to come through across the map. It was a back from Valley who's going to ult back to lane. I, again, I still felt like there was a timer somewhere in here for someone to rotate for Rift Herald, and it seems like that's actually going to end up being Purdue, where you see right now Flawed Logic moving to the top side of the map. The back from Valley means some aggression can come down onto the Aurelia, and the Azir has just been perma-pushing Def Ref in preventing TPs yeah. or ultimates across the map. They, uh, Purdue is slowly gaining some control in this game. This is a wonderful question. This was one of my favorites to read in the entire <laughs> tournament. That is absolutely wonderful. What do you want to do after you graduate from college? Retire at age 40 and become a rice farmer in Southeast China. All right, I like it. Nice, respectable living in a nice place. I, I can appreciate it. Although Clam now is going to be farming up this Rift Herald here. We'll see uh, See if we can get at least a little bit of advantage here for this objective focus of mm -hmm. Purdue. Want to know if they're going to try to throw it in top lane something easy? Almost! <laughs> Almost stolen by mm -hmm. the Jinx Rocket. Not gonna go there. Excruciatingly close. Clam was able to pull that off. They are making the rotation down to bottom side. Again, it was, I, I think, if you rotate a little earlier, this definitely happens, but because they, they waited a little longer, there was maybe a potential to contest this, but never comes through from Purdue. So instead, U of T just takes the Dragon trade. They're going to stall the game out a little bit longer. Top lane turret also had the pressure of Lulu being applied to it since no one came up mm -hmm. to contest Rift Herald. Now an attempted play uh -oh. onto Valley. Lil Frosty's here as well as Flawed Logic, and TP's coming behind as well. You do have a lot of focus, a lot of resources being dumped up here, but 527 can't find the reach they were looking for. And the two for Purdue get out. That they do. Not going to find anything with the TP. TPs this game haven't really been the most effective no, on haven't. either side to find any aggressive play. This is a really nice area, though. You have to be very careful if your arch is. If the Q lands, you end up very heavily taking a big health bar disadvantage. His ears on bottom side trying to match the pressure. Uh, and you can see the rockets are starting to stack some damage onto this tower right now. As Defraf's going to have to cross map to get down to bottom lane and KRP, or Kerp, my apologies, should be able to take this bottom tower very easily away from the side of the map. Now can Aurelia, okay, Aurelia does match, of course, on top lane. So again, these two teams are just trading blows back <laughs> yeah. and forth extremely equally this game. 
and they're just the opposite side every time there's something that goes on there's there's a response somewhere and you have to love it it's not one of those one-sided matchups we're very very even cresting that 17 minute mark and Ooh. now the rift hero is going to be spawned in mid lane we'll see if we can get the tower here for purdue they do still have a lot of wave clear available and clam is pressing up on donkey over here tower almost goes down the minion wave not there just yet it's going to be so close but the defense, at least, for U of T is going to be there. Let's see if they can do so just now. There's that wave clear I was talking about. So quick and so fast for U of T. Yeah, if you, if you looked at where Purdue, I think, was coming from here, you had two options. If you wait for the wave, you might be able to just full blitz this tower down. But the fear then is that Def Ref clears enough on bot side to be able to ult back to mid lane, and all of a sudden you throw a risk of a 5 on 5 where a Jinx is there, a Morgana's there, and there's some yeah. legitimate chance of turning. So instead, they jump the wave, they throw the Rift Herald quickly, they pull off a very large chunk of the tower health down to maybe 10% of its own health bar. And yes, they do end up not getting the tower, but at least there was no chance of counterplay from Def Ref, who had to catch bot lane Otherwise, two full waves are going to crash. You're going to lose a fair amount. And that fight doesn't even necessarily go your way. So it's risk analysis from UOT, making sure they're not going to lose too much. And Purdue just being able to pull off a very large amount of that tower. Soon enough, we'll be able to spring that tower down and potentially end up taking that one, freeing up their map. The other side still has the mid tower down as well. Uh, we talked about the Age of Empires thing, but really, this does feel <laughs> a lot more RTS-like than we're used to within the collegiate scene. It does indeed. You, you know, we got armies attacking different mm -hmm. spots. We got we got bases falling on opposite sides of the map. It's fine. It's just an RTS. Go back to the days of Warcraft Three. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know how it goes. Um, I I would like to say that the mid lane focus now for both teams is really interesting because we're not seeing the full commits in mid lane. We're just seeing a lot of people like, okay, I'm I'm here. I'm here. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, okay, nothing's gonna happen. Okay, I'm gonna I'm they just gonna go back to farm. This. Okay, I'm going yeah. mid. I'm going mid. Nothing's gonna happen over and over again. But now we get the full commit here from Purdue. They're gonna finally get that mid tower and make some difference in this game so far. I was really hoping to see a play. It looked like maybe Def Ref was considering walking up and trying to press an ultimate into the mid lane, looking for a fight and a TB to come from 527, which still has yet to be used to get him into a fight. And I would love to see UOT take a shot at some point. The gold is still really even. Neutral objectives yeah. still currently favor UOT, so you have to appreciate that. If they can get down mid tower, they're still in pretty decent command of what's happening in this game. But this is far and away the most even game we've had the pleasure of putting yeah. on uh, the stream so far. Round of 32 was never really this close this is literally 200 gold at 17 minutes this is nearly unheard of at this point in any league of legends games even a top level professional <laughs> you're seeing leads higher than this so these two teams incredibly equally matched as the baron i don't think that's gonna be fair it should be rift herald right is the timer just oh timer's frozen okay so it's not 17 minutes i was trying to make sure i was, I was trying to figure out what's happening here. It's like, it's 17 does minutes, why is baron's <laughs> we're stuck in time we're stuck in my favorite place summoner's rift We'll be here forever, ladies and gentlemen. Um, <laughs> that that's why no one's. The, that's why no one's getting funny. kills or anything. It's yeah, 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 the yeah. Timer's yeah. Seventeen minutes. <laughs> um, we'll see how this goes, though. We're getting a <laughs> lot of focus around this dragon pit. It is an infernal soul, right? It, it is due for that attention here. We have thirty-five seconds until that spawns. Both teams looking for it. U of T on soul point. If they do grab this one, which will give them a ton of pressure around the map. And you see both teams are already fighting over this vision, trying to get that set up for themselves. Ooh. Look at this back coming through. I think Aurelia is going to be able to finish the Mythic, and this is the two-item mark we are talking about being the potential Trinity's done, Blade of the Rune King's done, yeah. TP's available to this dragon. Like you said, really important. This is the fight we've been waiting for. Valley's going to TP Finally! Into. They pulled control of the mid lane. They're coming down into the river. Is this a contest, or will U of T just give this one away? I don't think they have the movement for it. Clam's Clam! going in deep! He goes in, there's the heroic interest, so look at the back line. Donkey has separated the fight completely. Valley is by themselves, there's the Vanguard death. 527 is popping off the back line. Holy Kerp goes over the wall, but right to his death. No, it's going to be the turnaround. Holy Kerp gets the killing spree. Valley has gotten the solo kill on the side, but 527 is still alive and the health bars are low. Can the outplay come through? It's not going to be enough. The strength is there, and Purdue come out on top. 
That was about as close a fight, and we've been waiting like 20, 25, 30 minutes, whatever it's been. I don't know because the timer's messed up, but however long we had to wait for it, it was 100% worth the wait as we finally get our fantastic 5-on-5 five five that very nearly flipped the UOT, but instead, it's going to be the even dragon count and finally control of the game taken. You see this, Clam goes so deep, the Galio splits the fight completely, and how so does Donkey on the backside with that Morgana ultimate with the Infernal Chain, sets up 5-2-7. Notice, Seiko mode was pushed out the backside, goes on to Azir as well, but that means 5 Two seven has no way back in because there's no vision, nobody to queue to, so has to carry on the backside of this fight basically on his own. That Look at that buster, buster shot, shot that Arch. buster You're shot nuts, was the game man. changer. That was oh. it. That was how they yeah. the separation right there made the difference. I feel so bad. I gotta pour one out here for Psycho Mode because uh that feels so <laughs> bad to just get ran down by Valley and have nothing to say about it. Even throws the ulti point blank because you're just frustrated. But it does mm -hmm. not matter. Purdue pick apart the fight. They're able to take the dragon. And all all of a sudden, you know, you get this gold lead going in favor of Purdue. Mm -hmm. You get some strengths on some of these carries. We talked about how scary some of these late game carries can be in this game. And all of a sudden, you're getting gold on Tristana. You're getting gold on this Azir. And it's starting to look a little scary. I will say, if Seiko Mode is able to kind of link alongside the Aurelia's damage, this fight probably looks a lot different. So I will yeah. give tons of props to the side of UOT, who are able to make some things happen. So big, big props to them. Uh, we're waiting through this replay also just to make sure that there's there's some other things. It looks like maybe another fight was gearing up here. Maybe that's what we're looking at right now. I'm sure we will get back to live <laughs> shortly. It does look it like was the, the Baron, Baron was started actually here. By... Uh, I had to walk away though side of UOT, but yeah, they do back away. But anyways, great fight there from Purdue, honestly, being able to kind of pick it apart like that. I think that there's so many little mm -hmm. interactions in that one that was so important, and especially that buster shot we were talking yes. about, and I, I really like to see that kind of stuff coming down, but that's our first real fight, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. our first, that's the first time we're getting the big 5v5 fight, and, and Purdue's able to get it. That we are. I will say a few things to take away. This Aurelia is super lethal, and on third yeah. item, there's going to be some real fear of that one. Arch, you know, without the heroic buster shot, that fight looks really, really bad. KR Kerp got pushed out of the fight pretty easily. There's 527 with another oh. interaction. Has the Karma here for some shielding. TP's in. They're going for another fight. There's a TP also coming in there from Def Ref. If they can take this with the heroic entrance, they can have a really nice little fight here. Ooh, Mega Death Rocket trying to steal away the red. Not going to do it. I was looking for U of T to try to pick a fight in those clustered areas, especially with Def Ref, but they don't pull the trigger on it, and now everything kind of calms down. That they do. I will say it was TP committed by the side of Purdue University to make that fight happen, so they burnt the resources, and they were the ones that came away with nothing. So there is at least that to consider. Def Ref TP'd well up to the mid lane as well. Oh, Def Ref did too. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. They still yeah. needed to pull mid lane. I will say it's probably more valuable to pull uh, Curbs TP. But yeah, like you said, because the response of both of them, it's not going to mean as much. So Purdue, they were fishing for a bit of a fight. They weren't able to find it. It was actually a decent trap from Seiko mode as well to actually deny any yeah, forward was... pressure from Arch, which came out in the middle of that one. But again, we're getting these super tense moments between <laughs> these two teams that amount to uh, effectively nothing until we see them fight around these neutral objectives, which is perhaps the most exciting version as we get to talk constantly about about, like what are they doing on the map what are they doing to put gold <laughs> in these carries what item spikes have they arrived on and how do these fights play out because that's the most exciting way to play league legends again all rts style this is just control yeah, control it's literally control, just age fight. of empires <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> just, it's fantastic. we've changed this into, into age of empires that's the future of league of legends here uh it is u of t looking on the top side mm -hmm. though they have been spotted out at least uh seco mode and, and donkey have been spotted out on the on the move but Little Frosty, 527, we're looking for. Clam is now up here. Starting to look at a tussle potentially. No glass cone to get them away from oh. here. Yeah, that was really close. Donkey mm -hmm. looking for the catch outs. Didn't really have it right there. The bindings have not been on point for Donkey. Not to not to slam Donkey in any fans, but there are a few times they've just been throwing cues in what seems like opposite directions, almost predicting where the other person's gonna be, instead of just lobbing them directly at the opposition, which I think is mm. is far more effective in a lot of different cases. But so far hasn't really been able to catch anybody Wait. out. That is one tool that can be used as with an Azir and a Tristana and even an Udir for yeah. consistent damage, there is a lot of Baron pressure here for this team. So if they knew exactly where U of T was right now, they'd already be on the Baron and probably having taken it by now, but because they don't have that uh, knowledge right now, no wards in the opposing jungle to track where the enemy team's going to be, they aren't able to make that one happen. 
We've got another dragon fight coming up here oh, very, yeah. very soon, Rebel. One of these teams is going to pull away with the soul mm -hmm. point and have a ton of pressure on the map. It's already looking like Purdue taking the onus on that one. They want to make sure they Ooh, can get it. Baron Although, I was going to say, I, you know, U of T can go with some wild stuff. Maybe you go for the uh, the opposite side play, but you got to expect that Purdue's going to be here to answer. Ooh. They are already jetting over here. You've only got three members in the pit. TP Nobody else is nearby. You have the TP from 527 if you need to pull that trigger. They pull off the Baron, though, because they see what trouble was coming. The thing is right now that like if you're U of T, you have to make them, you know, force them to call a bluff at some point because if they just drag or grab Infernal Drake for free, that means that the fourth dragon's going to have to be a fight. And you see, they keep pulling them back to Baron. This would have to be a blitz if they knew that the dragon was started already. They're going to go for it anyway, which I really appreciate. Now. This is how you play this game right now. I love this from U of T. They're going to have to fight their way out of this pit, but I do they love are. this They've Baron. They've got to do soon. They've got two members, the strong members coming up. They've got to take the fight if they can. Here it goes on to the main members right oh, now. Valley stunned. is getting very low. That survival, though, is going to be huge. 527 gets flawed logic on the back. 527 goes down to Arch, though. The shutdowns are coming through. And it's U of T looking to pick apart the fight. But look at the jump in from Arch gets the double. And there's only two members left, but it is a strong duo for U of T. They are left without their crucial members, though. Seiko mode is all by himself as the carry, but cannot find the avenue to get Arch and Holy Kerp. And what a fight from Purdue. Oh, my goodness, right there. You saw almost 527 dominating that backline. They were able to shred the Scion fast enough. This one minion might be enough to take this one. I love this Baron call. You have to call something. They put two members, Tristana and the opposite there as well. I love the block as well. But your two damage dealers out of the fight so long, you buy enough time to bring down Valley in the front line. Clam can't ever really find a perfect angle to get in here. And this is a perfect stall coming out from the Purdue members that are here. Once the uh, damage arrives, though, the dive is on. You see 527 able to get barely dodged that Azir ultimate and pressure into the backline all that necessary. Thankfully, both damage dealers able to bring 527 for any real damage wow. was done. Seiko mode on the other side, free to just throw damage into the opposition. Can't ever get into position to put down damage onto anybody else, which is a tough sentiment where it's like Seiko mode has to put so much damage into these tanks, can't ever put damage into backliners. They're really relying on 527 to do that work. Wasn't able to clutch it up in this one, but still really close fight and i loved the call coming out from u of t arch is a monster yes <laughs> that, like oh, this tristana is popping off right now the movements the outplays the mechanics coming through is just so so strong and you love to see it on this potential carry champion although seco mode will get that mid tower mm -hmm. as we see in this replay we do and it should be, um, last Whisper item, I think, should be completed. Yes, Lord Dominix is now completed for the Jinx. So that front-to-back team fighting that U of T has been playing to will be a lot easier now because, uh, of course, the penetration has come through. You have to be afraid because Arch has finished Infinity Edge, which is your main damage dealer. I want to see, I, I almost would have wanted to see, like, a Death Stance or a Guardian Angel in the, the inventory of 527 mm. to ward off some additional damage instead of what looks like it will be a Black Cleaver or something like that to put additional damage in for Seiko mode. As that appears to be the win condition that U of T's comp is going to have to lean on but importantly purdue this is a team they have a bunch of damage threats they've got good team fighting and things of that sort when they're able to deny access for 527 and they've got three dragons they're going to be able to force yeah. in only two minutes around this dragon to set up another fight that u of t has to be prepared for third item steric gauge from 527 these are probably yeah. the core items that are going to be done for this next team fight to come through in about two minutes time maybe a handful of extra components or maybe one finished item here for donkey def ref something like that Baron is called. I don't think this is a full commitment or anything like that because it's only the two members. They get spotted out pretty quickly. But still, tension is rising for this next team fight. And if that Infernal Soul goes to Purdue, there could be real trouble in team fighting with that much damage and that much backbone with an Infernal Dragon behind it. And I want to go back to what we were talking about in the draft and as we were getting into the game, right? We're, we're talking about U of T. We're talking about the execution, the, the high ceiling that they have for execution, that they need to be on top of their A game. I've been starting to see in these team fights where that ease of execution is coming out on top for Purdue. You're getting yeah. a lot of split fights. You're getting a lot of split focus from U of T. And as this composition, you can't have that. You need to be focused targeting. You need to be getting these members. And one thing for me is that push and pull that we were talking about. You're seeing a lot of split between 5 two seven and the rest of the team if five two seven can get the team make those plays happen around those fights that's where things start to improve for U of T. 
I think importantly, especially during the last fight, you did get to highlight what 527 was able to get to backline without the Azir ultimate tagging. And if you can combine that perfectly with Galio, all of a sudden, there's not much that can be done by the likes exactly. of PRB or, or, or Arch or anything like that. They have to use the disengages that they've got just to oh, make sure no. they come through. Then you turn and win. This, this is, is tough. There's no vision here. Everyone's gone. Back from the Donkey. They have nothing. Way. They literally don't have any response here. The Barons oh, already have no. health, and what a play from Purdue. They sneak out the Baron. They've been baiting it the whole time. They just do it. Okay, they caught a perfect timer here. UFT was resetting, looking for this dragon fight to come through, but it was just a Baron sneak. They're going to be able to pull mid lane pressure off of this and just shove down mid lane, maybe even look for mid inner. But for the most part, all this Baron buff is going to accomplish before this dragon fight is getting this massive mid priority. It's still going to have to be a fight to come through for oh. the dragon. Arch jumped in. Can't find that kill though. And Satchel Charge gonna do a good amount of damage on the back end of that one. Almost gets the kill on Lil Frosty. <laughs> Lil Frosty's gonna have to be back for that Maybe one. And that here. just means that snowballing no. the pressure from the Baron Pit to the mid lane to the Dragon Pit. There's one potential oh! steal! It's stolen! And now the fight's gonna it. ensue afterwards. You do have Predator popped, a lot of damage on Def. Def is down, Arch is unstoppable now. They wanna continue jumping right onto the traps, but here's the Shurima Shuffle, not gonna hit it. Emperor's Divide not gonna go through just yet. Don't wanna pull that trigger. But after everything is said and done, Seiko Mo with the steal. They, they did it. The Jinx Ultimate, we talk about this all the time. Being it was so it was like, used to steal dragons. It was just like uh, it was it was like it was in a textbook right there. I don't know. <laughs> The whole play was in slow motion. It was so much pressure from Purdue where they're like, okay, we got bear and we shoved up mid lane. We can do this. We can make this play happen. This oh, rocket my is God. perfect. Oh my goodness. The fight afterwards completely unnecessary. They do get the pick on a Galio. But the greatest part is Purdue was not expecting whatsoever that this was going to get stolen. They wanted the fight. They wanted the dragon. They wanted to close this game out. But they don't have anything set up for the Baron buff. Their waves are pushed to the right position to punish off the back of that play where they pulled Galio. All of a sudden, U of T has been sprung back into life. They're down 2,000 gold. That means a pittance at 35 in into the game. You got more time for your team to put, put together items for this 5 5 that keeps happening over over and over again they got themselves a second life their guardian angel back into this game u of t is still here to play you gotta be careful though baron buff is still on all mm -hmm. these members for purdue they're using it effectively you gotta get some backs you gotta get defense up on this base you cannot lose these inhibs and you're already losing this tier two tower in the top lane you got a nice response mm -hmm. on that inhib tower for u of t but they're going to continue to try to barrel this down the important thing, I think, mostly is getting Jinx onto item 4 for the next bear and the next dragon. If that comes through, all of a sudden your front line gets melted. If you're on the side of Purdue, you have the penetration there as well. Uh, you know, not, or 527 might be able to get on a fourth item as well. This is tough. We, you know, you know, sieging down right now is Purdue with this Baron buff. They're able to make things work with the Tristana. You just have to wait this out and hope that you're not going to just lose everything off the back of a fight here in this base. Right, just always pop. Oh, hits the Dark Ooh. Binding, but not none to be enough. Not in time there. Right. They do find the front line on Clam. Don don't have the health very low. Soul Shackle's gonna go invulnerable there. Not gonna find it. There's the Vanguard's oh. edge. That's huge. The Unstoppable Onslaught comes back to response. Valley goes down. Donkey is gonna get, get, get the kill. 527 wants it. Got the resets, oh. but nice little move <laughs> from Holy Curp gets them out of there. Oh, that was, I, I was sweating there for Holy Curb for a minute as right there, Valley has to be left behind. It's a sacrificial land. They push into the base. They lose a number of their health bars, especially onto Arch and Curb, who aren't able to actually stand as far forward in this fight to put out damage as you wanted. And UOT had an opportunity there, but thankfully again, Valley, that front line, able to stand in front of everybody, make sure 527 can't get into the back line. Everyone able to disengage how well. There is now defensive tools pulled off the side of Purdue here for UOT around this next Baron around this next track and this game is uh it's it's giving me anxiety right now <laughs> they're so back and forth this is incredible oh what a game to kick us off of the day of league of legends here the round of 16. gotta appreciate everything <laughs> that these teams are laying on the line here about to be 36 minutes in we're tied up in dragons the next one is going to be a deciding fight the death timers are huge mm -hmm. now we've got the base pretty opened up on the side of u of t so if you do lose a fight you know purdue have the onus to just take the game you've got to know that and you've got to play with that in the back of your mind when you're taking these next fights you have to make those calm calculated decisions that you do right now okay okay they're trying to force right here maybe 
They found Don Donkey. Donkey's gonna die. Donkey's oh, already dead. That's a main force here, but Ooh. that's the trade as Clam goes down to the shutdown over to Little Frosty. It is now 4v4. No junglers on the map, but we still have carries, and that's all that really matters. Holy Kerp goes for it. There's the unstoppable onslaught right into the back. Vanguard's edge comes down on top. Emperor's divide to separate the fight. Broke entrance comes down. Who's gonna go down first, though? Death Ref falls Arch. out with the flash, but that's Ooh. the satchel charge gonna get the shutdown. That was a tense fight right there, and it's going to be taken here. They're going to grab bottom tower. They could probably just turn for dragon as well here in only about 38 second time as both Donkey and Clam are down. That was a tough situation. I think, honestly, UOT could have just pulled off that tower and called it even because all they needed to do was shove out that bottom way, make sure there's nothing. Now, 9 to, or 527 has to really put in some effort to try to win this one. Otherwise, Infernal's is going to go over, and this game becomes a lot harder to win. There's another inhib tower gone. Not the inhib, though. You still do got to deal with the super minions funneling into top That's lane. Tough. And as you said, the dragon spawning here. You've got to make a play down to this because this infernal soul is going to be huge for either side. And you see they're forgiving or at least forgetting about the top lane. They say it doesn't matter if we lose. The Actually, no, they turn around. They don't the last have it. That's just a free infernal soul going over as well to Purdue. Nothing to be had right there. I respect that they're not going to go way too heavily for it. I love this play. They jump over to try to find Donkey. No Zonia is able to be used, but then the taunt up to try to get Clam. And they just trade right there, right there. I think right here they could have potentially broken and not tried for a fight, but it felt like 527 was calling to make sure that they knew something could come through. The polymorph was gorgeous from Flawed Logic yeah, to make sure 527 couldn't jump in. And this ultimate from Valley, this frontline from Valley, the combined with the Azir wall as well, was huge to make sure this fight stalled off. One rocket, two rockets right there on the Earth. so had close sweating but the bomb of course dropped onto jinx was enough to pull off the jinx or from the tristana my apologies kills off the jinx and now no health bars to compete that means that bottom tower and dragon both go into the favor of purdue who now have a very very big advantage in these fights they have to pick some of this damage off otherwise this fight's going to be impossible for uft to win and you just look at the base and you struggle to find how mm -hmm. to deal with this push and pull for U of T. You've got to deal with the minions pushing into your base. If you go to your base, the Baron gets immediately Comes started clam. up, taken down. Donkey's going to try to get engaged on, but Clam doesn't find it after the Black Shield comes down. And as you see, they're just waiting. They're waiting for the one misstep of U of T so they can <laughs> burn down this Baron. They're just going to burn it down anyway, I think, right here and right now. There, there, There is competition to be had, as now what you see is U of T is working their way into the pit. But yeah, Purdue's just goading out the fight. They're trying to take this one. They know for a fact that if they put pressure onto anything else, there's possibility that damage is going to drop onto Arch, onto Kerp, and they're not going to be able to respond to it. So instead, they're just willing to keep there pushing. They don't want to commit to a Baron. Oh, the Scion Speedway moves coming in for Valley. Donkey's going to get taken down. Goes I'm Golden. Broke entrance right into the middle of the fight. Death oh, Rest is on crunch! everybody. Look at the stream of shuffle though it's gonna be huge 527 is gonna be polymorph is gonna be taken down psycho mode, psycho mode. my god you're going Can't psycho go we got the 1v1 arch gets the outplay but it doesn't matter they did it. a triple kill is all they get as the fight goes over to u of t they, oh my goodness, Purdue's got Infernal Soul. They can't take this almost certainly with just the Morgana and the Karma, but heroics from just about everybody on both teams as much as possible. But finally, Seiko Mode gets into one of these fights with the Jigs, and you're able to just drop shots over and over and over again. The backline pressure from 527 by so much space here to be able to get Jinx to come up. Valley tries. The Black Ooh. Shield's too easy for Donkey. Finally, the Zonius comes through too, so the ultimate to use. Galio ultimate on top of it as well to make sure they can put that stun up and watch Seiko Mode Look in the Seiko. back working his yeah. way. And then the 527 kills off Valley in backline, gets a ton of pressure into Flawed Logic as well, so that's two kills for the Aureli in the backline to allow Seiko Mode to work his way forward. Two rockets, that's all you needed. You lose the duel against the Infernal Soul uh, Tristana, that's that's words that obviously are going to come through, <laughs> but thankfully your final two members are able to make the play happen into the Tristana, and again U of T pull out a fight to keep themselves relevant inside of this game. We're going to the next play, we're going to next Baron, we're going to Elder Soul, man. This is, this is incredible. This is absolutely incredible seco mode with that positioning was just insane in that fight mm -hmm. both these adcs showing out in their mechanics in this first game this is just the first this game, game Rebel. this is game number one of the day and i cannot be more happy we do still have purdue playing around this baron we're still dancing this dance to see if they can steal it out from under u of t I'm going to give one problematic issue here to the side of U of T, which is that Bloodthirster has been completed for Arch, so killing this Tristana is going to be near impossible unless you get two damage sources Baron. onto it. Yeah, this Baron's just dead. There's not much they to be able to do. TP is coming in. They're looking for a fight. Seconds. They want to take this fight. If they can steal it, no. 
It's not going to go down. The Mega Death Rock comes in too late. You have got five purpled up champions here ready to push down this mid lane getting it back from 527 needs to get back to defend you see the resets coming in across the board for u of t they know that they need to draw the line in the sand here two inhibitors exposed currently mid inhibitor also going to be exposed almost certainly off the back of this one u of t if they want to defend it feels like they have to make oh, a play they got a logic there's the soul shackles into five members the rogue entrance comes in it's not gonna be enough just yet look at seco mode Seco's that's mode. the first divide that's the game changer holy curb you have done oh. it you have taken the fight into your hands and completely wiped u of t off of summoner's rip this game number one is gonna go to purdue but what a slog it was what a fight it was between Don't these say two anything teams. yet and they have come to play no that's gotta be it vanguard's edge comes out couple more for five two seven gonna go down <laughs> Purdue take game number one. Oh my god, that was a the definition of the word banger is this series right here already because that game one was immaculate. It took so long, but finally Purdue was able to get their back line out of the way. You weren't able to work your way through the front line fast enough on the side of U of T, and everything was able to move forward. And finally, Kerb also able to get in a back line and put some extra damage in with the Zazir to just win through all of these carries. That was about as good as a series we could ever expect, though. How close could you possibly make it? Purdue slow played some of the early game, I think, more than necessary. And University of Toronto willing to call their plus over and over, take this game late. And yes, it went uh, on the opposite side because of that Infernal Drake and other reasons. But they made it about as close as you could expect any team to do. And I love those Emperor's Divides coming out all game long, not really getting the massive one you're always looking for. You know, game-changing ult right at the end doesn't matter ends the game off of it it's fine <laughs> uh, so great performances coming up across the board to hear more about that first match that banger is going to be the analyst desk we'll see you on the other side Well, ladies and gentlemen, I do not know about you if you caught any of the MSI games this morning. <laughs> Those games were running hot. These games running hot as well on the Academy stream as, man, what a game won from Purdue versus the University of Toronto. Once again on the desk, I'm Cubby joined by Dylan and Horif here to break all the action down. And man, what an action-packed game we had. I want to get right into things. I know immediately talking about uh, the first replay, the, the skirmish in the mid lane, mm -hmm. Dylan, big three for one for Purdue. They got off to a good start. Things were running well for them early. Yeah, we'll get rolling right into this replay. But honestly, like you said, you know, Purdue was off to the races in the beginning portions of this game. You know, their team composition, you could argue whether or not it's, you know, really that good in the early game. I feel like they definitely outscale. They have the, the Azir paired with the Lulu and uh, Tristana as well, but this is honestly a little bit of an awkward start to the fight. We had Clam and Flawed Logic just kind of stuck into the enemy jungle and really solid counter engage coming out from the side of U of T Esports, but this is where it's honestly just mid difference, right? Defref <laughs> able to get the Galio ultimate down the hero's entrance, but Kerb just had such an amazing team fight there. You know, the Sharima Shuffle, which is something that comes up again in later replays that we had. Huge performance from him this game, and then also from Arch, who we have in future replays. These players just played so well for Purdue, and they had to. Yeah, the, the, the two big carries with the two threat comp, they got off to a decent start early, but man, was University of Toronto a pest throughout Horif? I know that this is a team that you have a a lot of experience with the uh, first hand being the uh, cover caster for University of Waterloo and also uh, participating in that league uh, for Ontario Esports as well. I know that we have another dragon fight coming with the fourth dragon pretty soon, but uh, Horf, uh, this is something that you've seen a, a lot more footage on this team. And I know they ended up dropping game one, but the fact that they were able to keep things so close in a draft where you said, Man, like, what does this Aurelia do into the Lulu? It really felt like they were doing all they could to keep this game as close as possible, and we see that quite a bit in this fourth dragon fight. Yeah, I mean, this fourth dragon fight was something else. I want to hear Horov's thoughts on it in a second, but in a really, really solid engage from Purdue, we saw the, the Udyr flash paired with Valley on the Scion, able to reach the backline psycho mode down towards the bottom side of the fight, just dying one on one with the Scion. But keep your eyes on 527. Honestly, just a very dominant team fight, but then Arch saves everything with a beautiful buster shot here. 
Yeah, for sure. That Tristana ultimate really messed up the Irelia. If Irelia was able to get that key mm -hmm. reset onto the Tristana, she, uh, Tristana would have died, and that just makes Purdue lose all of their damage. Um, so yeah, Tr Irelia getting that Q cancelled by the Buster Shot is definitely a big thing for Purdue. So Arch played that fight out very well. Um, it was unfortunate for Sycamore, he kind of got stuck with that Scion back there. <laughs> so the, so basically, <laughs> Yoti was kind of out of an ADC during that fight because you know, Scion was on the Jinx. So there's nothing that Jinx can do there, really. Um, so yeah, I think the next fight that we're going to look at is that Baron. Con uh, contest fight, which UFT started up the Baron and Purdue actually, I think, finished up the Dragon and then ran right there. I think we can just, you know, hop into that yeah. replay there. Yeah, so so that fight, I, I love the fact you pointed out the Tristana Buster Shot on the Aurelia, Rebel Fox and, and Mazel, they both caught that as well. Such mm -hmm. a critical play yeah. from Arch and another critical play, honestly, from Arch to save this upcoming team fight as you were referencing, Horif, as they got into the Baron a little bit late, they were taking the Dragon, but they ended up able to pull this fight back in their favor off the back of, as Dylan mentioned earlier, good play from their two carries. Yeah, before we hop into that one, just talking about the greater, you know, macro play at hand there, it felt like Purdue had a really solid read of the map. They knew that the, the Baron DPS was not really on the cards for U of T at that point. The Jinx wasn't too far ahead. The Morgana wasn't too far ahead. So they knew that they were able to kind of stretch themselves thin, use three members towards the top side to dissuade the Baron while also securing Dragon. You could make an argument, maybe you don't need Azir and Tristana down there, but Purdue comes up here and they, they pull off a huge fight to stop the Baron as well. Just... Yeah, I know that uh, it is su such close play. Horif, what were your thoughts on the carry play coming out here from Purdue? Um, I think in this fight, Arch was able to kind of get onto the, like, or was able to reach there in time to start dishing out damage. Mm. Um, so, and also, again, we saw that he canceled the Irelia Q again um, in, during this yeah. fight, which definitely saved his life there. Uh, Sycamore was also, again, zoned out by the Udyr and by this Ion. Um, so, yeah, Sycamore really hard committed to that Udyr, even flashing for the kill, but he didn't actually end up getting the kill. If he had gone the reset, um, gone that Jinx uh, passive onto the Udyr, maybe. Uh, he would have been able to rejoin the fight a little bit faster, but he hard committed for that kill into Udyr and didn't get it, which really messed up the team fight near the end, and that's how like Arch and the others were able to get away at the end of that fight. Yeah, and another point to hit on there is, you know, Purdue, if they're able to, or if they commit everybody towards the dragon there, if they commit four or five people down towards the dragon and all of their vision, all of their resources, it's going to be pretty hard to actually get into that Baron. So it was very mm -hmm. smart of them to realize that they have the... The, the strength in their team composition at that point to kind of split their members because if they're walking into a river that they have no vision of in the top side it's going to be very dangerous you're walking into morgana irelia could be anywhere she could be on a flank and so by kind of splitting your members up you guarantee that you're going to at least know that they're starting baron you're going to know how your carry should position when they get there and they end up playing the fight beautifully <laughs> Yeah, so uh, leading up to this point, the game was already pretty hectic. These fights are pretty close. Horf, I love the fact that you're pointing out the resets, you know, both from the Jinx and the Tristana, so important to both team comps. But what really brought it back, what really started to make this game exciting was not only the, the Jinx steal that we had on the Dragon. We're not going to have that replay, but that was a huge play from Seiko Mode. But this one specifically, Seiko Mode absolutely goes off, Dylan. Yeah, I mean, as soon as we get this replay pulled up, this is the one where... It started to look like UFT Esports was actually going to pull this off. We see another beautiful Scion engage from Valley, but the Morgana Black Shield just putting in a lot of work. You know, Morgana in terms of damage was not really pumping out, you know, too much this game, but in terms of utility and crowd control, she was very useful. Sicko Mode was able to just find a beautiful flash over the wall here, and things get so That's close. So Frosty's looking for a flash over the wall to shield, but Psycho Mode's actually kiting away from where the Karma Flash could be. If she was a little bit closer to that wall, maybe Karma gets there in time. Maybe if you swap to the minigun, the DPS, you know, shift is enough to pull off that kill. But it just stinks for U of T because the Baron was up. They just didn't have the damage to take it with the Karma and Morgana. So that fight at the end of the day was just gold going back to, you know, the carries on each side who were already pretty much full build. So it was kind of meaningless until this last fight. Mm -hmm, for sure. Hey. Like, sorry. Um, that uh, that fight worked out really well for um, UFT, but you know, if you get all these kills and you just have um, two utility members on your team left alive, you're not doing much mm -hmm. uh, to convert those kills into objectives, into turrets, into uh, bear in there. So yeah, that's a really good point to bring up, Dylan. 
Yeah, and uh, I, I think that the back and forth that we had between both these teams, the game so close on a nice at knife's edge. We eventually were able to get Waterloo. They secured the dragon. They secured the Baron, and then the, the game-winning fight just to wrap things up. Dylan, you cheat, uh, teased the Sharima <laughs> shuffle uh, yeah. from Azir as no cheese was needed for this fight to end up wrapping things up. And uh, Horif, kind of as we go through this last replay, the game-winning fight here for Purdue, what are your overall thoughts on this game? If you are a Toronto fan, what are some of the things that you are looking for your team to maybe switch up going into this game to try and make this a three-game series? Um, I think they should kind of clean up their draft a little bit. I think the Irelia pick when you already see that Tristana, Scion, Lulu, um, you're not going to be able to, you know, get on to the back line. Um, Tristana is really easy to... Um, she's, she can basically just run away from Irelia. Irelia is going to have a really, really hard time trying to kill that Irelia, especially with that Lulu polymorph and, you know, Scion isn't exactly the easiest lane for you to, to bully, I guess. So it really, I think, I would love to see 527... Um, get put on a champion that uh, he's able to capitalize easier on mm -hmm. um, against uh, Purdue's team comps and team drafts that we've been seeing so far. Yeah, I'm just a little bit worried too for, for Donkey in the side of U of T because the Morgana mm -hmm. in a vacuum against Udyr is very good because you have the Black Shield against Udyr's stun, you have the Root and the ultimate to kind of dissuade his engage, but against the rest of the team, Morgana's not really offering much. Sure, you can put a Black Shield on top of Jinx, and she's able to kind of be a little bit more aggressive in these fights, but Morgana is really only realistically hitting the frontline members. She's not actually dealing damage. If she's able to flash into the backline, it just gets disengaged by the Azir and Tristana too easily. So I want to see Donkey maybe shift things up a little bit. The Morgana sure is a power pick on this patch, but there are other options that fare well into Udyr, and I'd love to see Donkey and the side of U of T maybe dip into those something they're more comfortable on. We're going to have to see if Donkey and University of Toronto Esports are able to make those changes as, ladies and gentlemen, the clock has hit zero. It's time to throw it back to our wonderful casters, Bazell and Earl Fox, to take us into this game too.